You're listening to Speak Your Peace, a podcast about social determinants of health. I am your host, Dr. Damian Kelly. I am Dr. Damian Kelly, and I will tell you, I'll let you introduce yourself to the people. Yeah, I'm, I'm Claire Mummert. Doctor, doctor, hopefully coming soon. It's we're speaking into existence. You will be a doctor <laughs> soon enough. Yeah, in like five years or so. But it still, goes by so fast. It's gonna happen. It's yeah, gonna I, happen. I'm 44. I got my doctorate last year this time. So I was 43 when I got it. There you go. I'll be right on track. I'm following in your footsteps. Gotcha. Uh, you can follow that student loan debt if you like as well. <laughs> I'm taking up collections. So if, uh, if you could help out with that, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> So we were talking about rock and roll. This podcast, we talk a lot about social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. I understand you are of a Native American background. Can you tell us a bit about that background? Yes. So unlike some of my amazing colleagues and friends, I did not grow up knowing about my indigenous background Mm -hmm. um, or my people. um, But it comes through my, my mom's side of the family and my grandfather on that side just he had a lot of trauma mm. and he just did not pass on kind of this information to us. So I didn't grow up on the reservation. I didn't grow up um, learning any anything. Um, and I came to it as an adult. So when you say trauma, what do you mean by that? Like He was, he fought in multiple wars. And he, really? Yes. And he worked as a sheriff deputy and just with everything he saw, he was, he became a very quiet man. He didn't talk very much. Understood. So I didn't know anything about him. And then he willed to me mm. um, a Choctaw to English dictionary in his will. And I was like, what is this? Huh. Okay. Mm-hmm. It, so I'm taking it you're from the Ta- Choctaw tribe? Through his side. Yes. That side I can't prove. Um, but, but they claim Choctaw heritage. But through his wife, mm. uh, my grandmother's side, we have been able to... to to find her Cherokee relative. Okay. Um, and I'm working on hopefully becoming enrolled in the future. Oh, but nice. still working on the documentation. I've heard it's a lot of documentation that needs to happen. It is. To and get. want to do it the right way, you know. Fair enough. Okay. So if you could, how does your Native American background really translate culturally to well-being? What does that mm-hmm. mean mm-hmm. Uh, for you? And I, I'm, I don't want to ask for your people. I just want to ask just for you. Yes. And we're going to speak for a larger group with that. Mm-hmm. So growing up, I've had a lot of health problems my whole life mm-hmm. and always found a lot of relief and clarity when I was outside, but didn't really you know, have any connection to why Mm -hmm. I might have felt that way. And as I learned more about my people um, and more about just good medicine. What's good medicine? Good medicine can be so many things and and different things to different tribes, of course. But good medicine can be, you know, communing with the creator, letting... Mm -hmm letting the, the smoke from the sacred fire carry your prayers up to, to the creator for mm. the creator to hear you. It can be communing kind of with the land because many people, many indigenous people believe that, you know, the animals were here first and, and they're actually our ancestors. They were here before us and that everything is living. Everything has like a soul of some kind. And so you have to give equal value to the trees as you would to your sister. You know, like everything wow. has spirit, everything has has value to the creator and that you were put here on purpose to take care of those things and to you know, commune well with those things. And as I've learned more about that connection and mm-hmm. that respect and then just different forms of prayer and and just good medicine, I've, I've been able to identify more, okay, how can I not only look to doctors, I still go to the doctor, I okay. don't write that off. Because I was going to um, the next question, like, okay, are you, <laughs> are we go into health care no, no, I still go to the doctor, but also I can find this connection and this more like holistic healing really in mind and in spirit and in body because they're all connected, mm. you know, through through the land and through taking care of the land and through connection to creator. So we did a forum. We're doing a thing called H-Town Chat. And 
we were do this one was for a Vietnamese audience mm -hmm. and they were saying something that they practice a lot of herbal medicine as well mm -hmm. and one of the healthcare providers was there and she said what's happening is that people are taking herbal medica medication mm -hmm. but not informing the actual physician that they're doing that as well mm -hmm. so sometimes that counteracts to use cancer for example the counteracts the chemotherapy things mm -hmm. that that people are receiving when you're when you're on this spiritual path and you're you're doing more holistic natural medicines, mm -hmm. how does that transcribe to your physician? Is there mm -hmm. pushback? Are they kind of like just rolling their eyes and like, sure, okay, go, go, go ahead, Earth Spirit, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here's your prescription yeah. from Pfizer. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, how, how does that? How do you how do you make that work? It really depends on the physician, person to person. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, I know. She's an OB. She also practices holistic medicine. So she's got her MD. Okay. But she's also open. And so I can talk to her about, okay, here's something I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And she's she's wanting to learn and she's wanting to listen. And like, okay, how can we have these things work together? Nice. But I'm, I'm usually not taking, you know, supplements. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how can I... How can I eat food? Like, I'm trying to grow more of my own food. Dude, I, grow, I have a garden in my backyard. Yes. I grow a lot of food also. And, and not only eating that food, but even the process of, like, my feet on the ground, my hands in the dirt, you know, I, I think there's a lot of value and mm. there's a lot of health to be found in those environments there is some things i hear online now when mm -hmm. people are like hey go touch some grass that is i think a popular meme that i've seen a couple times for mm -hmm. i guess for people who are spending too much time in online spaces mm -hmm. or uh certain forms mm -hmm. like dude go touch grass it, it's not that deep that kind of thing I, yeah. I definitely there is some truth to that reality mm -hmm. that yes that being in contact with Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. So I'm a religious person myself. Mm -hmm. However, I find that I am very close with God mm -hmm. when I'm out in nature, as opposed to being in a church. Yes, I'm much more closer with our Creator that way. Yes. My, if my mom's listening, I still go to church. <laughs> <laughs> so don't don't. I don't need the emails, the text messages, but I still go. But with that, I feel much more mm -hmm. at home and at one mm -hmm. with the creator that brought us here mm -hmm. when I'm out in nature. So I, I love that aspect of, of that identity, that this is how we commune. This is how we become one with our creator. So mm -hmm. I'm going on to another question. And I've actually rolled this one around for a bit. And I was curious, you know, his historical experiences mm -hmm. for indigenous populations, colonization, marginalization, how does that affect health outcomes you think when it comes to being indigenous mm -hmm. i think the level of trauma that is experienced by people it's generational it doesn't you know we we hear people say well the the trail of tears was a long time ago which in the scheme of things not really it really mm -hmm. wasn't but still the trauma from that is passed down people having to take the you know the the sacred bones of their ancestors they would they would sew them into their skirts and their dresses to carry them hmm. from um where they were living into oklahoma or trying to carry the ashes of their sacred fire so that they could practice but then we think of you know boarding schools there was the phrase uh, kill the indian save the man and they would okay. cut their hair off they would take away their language and um, refused to let them do any practices. And there was so much spiritually that was taken. Like the, the sun dance, for example, is with the Kiowa people was, mm -hmm. was taken. And so people say, you know, it was lost, but I prefer taken because it was, it was hostile, you know, the way that that happened. And there were many things that were not allowed for indigenous people. And that, that trauma continues because mm -hmm. now people in the present don't have that ceremony or they're having to learn their language for the first time. I didn't grow up learning the Cherokee language or mm. knowing the Cherokee syllabary. And I have to learn that. S the syllabary is that? The syllabary. It's like their alphabet. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, and you um, got to explain a lot for me as well as <laughs> the people listening at yes. home. And so, you know, you're, you're learning your language for the first time mm. and this should have been your first language and you don't even know it. No, no, and that makes sense. There's grief and there's trauma in that and a lot of those things and 
and just even some poor trading practices that were done to indigenous people have led to addiction, have led to poor mental health, Hmm. have led to even like I I saw, I was reading an article just um, this week about heart, higher heart issues. Like heart in, disease? Yes, okay. in indigenous communities. I've only read one article. I'm okay. obviously not a, <laughs> no, no. A, an expert there. But just thinking of all the stress mm. and all the trauma that people are experiencing. And then even now, they're meant to be sovereign nations. Mm-hmm. And they're still not always treated like sovereign nations. So for those listening who may not understand what a sovereign nation is. I have a, 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 a loose understanding of what it is myself. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so the way that the U.S. government should act toward the Cherokee people mm-hmm. is the same way that they're supposed to act toward, like, South Korea. It's like a country-to-country relationship. But it can always be... It can seem a little complicated because... That country, the Cherokee country, essentially, that sovereign nation is dwelling inside of Mm -hmm. the U.S. And that's why we see so many protests about pipelines and different things being built. It's because it's affecting indigenous land. Yes. And they feel like the federal government is not treating their land as their land. Okay. Right. That was... If memory serves, the Keystone Pipeline was that one of the pipelines they were talking That's about. Mm-hmm. The I think they, did they build that one, or I think it got built. Yeah, I know with the Dakota Pipeline, it didn't go on their land. Mm. Um, but if if there were ever any leaks or anything, it would contaminate all of their water, and mm-hmm. water is sacred. Yes, to tribal people. So you know they're trying to protect their land, mm. and there's not as much consideration. And even as far as like ceremony, you, if you ever try to talk to the Pueblo people, for example, they're going to keep it very secret because they know that ceremony has been banned time after time or been seen as like the heathen kind of thing time after time. And so they're constantly being like oppressed or persecuted for their Mm -hmm. beliefs. I know of um, one man in their tribe, there is a type of I feel like cutting isn't a great word because there's no blood, but they're making marks in their skin. Okay. And it's part of their spiritual practice. Mm. And CPS gets called on their children. Scarification, I think that's what it's called. I know there are tribes in Africa that do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, with with a kill, you make little slashes on your face or your arm and whatnot. Okay. Exactly. And so their children come to school and they Mm. have these marks, and the teachers are calling CPS, and some of the children are being taken from their families. Okay. All over a spiritual practice. And Hmm. so they're still kind of receiving oppression Mm. for their ceremony for their rituals and then even just trying to have their own land and their own space i guess for those who are working on the outside and and don't have privy to what's happening at reservations Mm -hmm. what would be a suggestion that you would have for them that's a that's a big question (laughs) we can can try to make it smaller also i know that i'm I'm, I'm kind of throwing out there in left field Mm -hmm. a little bit i I always say the first thing, because this is what I had, I have to do now even, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of a, a guest in this space because I'm still learning myself. And I think the most important thing to do is, is listen. And with the advent of social media, we mm. have access like we've never had before. And granted, you have to make sure you're following the right people, like who can actually speak for the tribe, that kind of thing. But following these groups and, and learning about them, and they're going to they're usually happy to tell you this is the issue. You know, this is what we're fighting for. If we can unpack some of that first statement you said, Mm -hmm. you said you you still feel like a guest or Mm -hmm. you are a guest. Mm -hmm. Two questions really quick to my head would be, A, how long will you be a guest Mm -hmm. and not family? And what makes you feel like you are a guest? Yes. I've never been treated like a guest, so I I should say that. I've only been treated with kindness, with Mm -hmm. love, with... um, There's a man in the Cherokee tribe who's... He's been talking to me, he's been helping me try to find the right records. He's Mm -hmm. great. I've I've never experienced anything um, like that myself. But I feel like a guest because I still... I don't know... You know, like when you enter a room Mm -hmm. and you intuit the rules of the room... um, you go to school, you know, I have to sit here. You know? I, I don't you. I don't always know the rules of the space. Hmm. And I'm still learning. What are the rules of the space? And 
what is appropriate mm. for me because there are even some things that like men do that women can't do that women do that men can't do you know um as far as spiritual practice and different tribes have different mm. um ways that they do that or there's like you know it wouldn't be appropriate for example for me to to burn sage over somebody and do a, some kind of ceremony because i'm not trained for that you know in my head i'm thinking and again, this is an oversimplification. You know, if you join a fraternity or sorority, mm -hmm. there's the initiation part mm -hmm. where, you know, you're getting to learn the customs mm -hmm. and the history. But then there's some sort of ceremony that happens. Mm -hmm. It says, okay, now you are an official member of XYZ, what have, what have mm -hmm. you. Does something like that need to happen for you in order for you to not feel like a guest? I mean, like, mm -hmm. okay, now, Professor Claire, you are officially... Mm -hmm. I think for me like language would be a big piece of it but I think if I could you know speak to my own people mm -hmm. like in our language that that to me I would feel like I don't know maybe I've finally done it but I don't know it's since it's a feeling it's hard to say mm -hmm. exactly when or you know I, I know that enrollment would be a big deal okay for me to be able to say like okay like I've I've checked all the boxes. It's I've, on paper. It's you know, official. It's on paper. And I know there are some people that do it because they want benefits of some kind. But to me, that's not what's important. It's that sense of belonging. that, And that sense of, of a way to honor and respect mm -hmm. the people that came before me, my ancestors. Would that be something you want to also pass down to your family as well? I'd love to pass on, yeah, that to my kids. And be able to teach them and, you know, I'm already, I've already talked to them a little bit, mm. you know, about, about this. And my daughter's really, really interested. Okay. She heard someone singing a song at school and she was like, my, my family is indigenous and I don't like the way that indigenous people are in that song. And what so song do they sing? I, like, so I'm so far removed from school. Help <laughs> me out like with a, this. What like they a sing? little kid song. It's like one little, two little, three, three little. Oh yeah, I said that when I was a kid also. Yeah. Okay. And, and she was like, I don't like the way indigenous okay. people are talked about there. And she'll like correct her friends. She'll be like. You know, and so she's already trying at least to to find a way to mm -hmm. you know connect. Okay. Um, and she's curious, mm -hmm. uh, but I I want to make sure that I I pass it down correctly too. And so I'm just still I'm still learning and just trying to tell her what I know as I know it. Well, it seems like from your experience that they are extending a lot of grace to mm -hmm. you. Grace to make those missteps is always something when you're trying to, I guess, really find out who you are everyone is trying to find out where they belong mm -hmm. and it seems that you have found your spot and you are slowly making that journey to go from guest mm -hmm. to no, you're at home this is your family mm -hmm. no so if you come to my house and you're a guest you don't have fridge rights exactly exactly <laughs> but you once your family take your shoes off at the door th thank you how like, about with the dishes there you go you can you slowly get to earn those kind <laughs> of like, what you want my refrigerator for? <laughs> no. <laughs> but now, like, oh, that's that's just so and so. Dog, they're they're here. They're family mm -hmm. now. Family. You have free range over that. Mm -hmm. I I can see that that's something that's very important to you to, to one day have that asset. And you can just if it, it goes beyond just a piece of paper. It's more. Mm -hmm. This is where I belong. This is exactly. part of my family lineage. This is who I mm -hmm. am. This is how I identify. It seems your daughter is already on that path also. <laughs> already correcting people. Yeah. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't want to be, I don't want to say something wrong. And she's like, that's not, I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I, I know nothing about this space. So just for those listening, we are in Southeast Texas, Houston. So the tribes that are closest to us, the Tunica Biloxi tribe, you also have, as you mentioned earlier, you have the Alabama Cachada tribe in Lake Livingston, that's mm -hmm. north of us. Where we are now, when we're having this conversation with these different tribes, the thing that you talked about earlier, <laughs> when we're talking about these different health disparities impacting indigenous Native American, what's some of the issues that you are encountering also? Mm -hmm. There's a lack of access in a lot of places where, you know, if you're, if you're living on a reservation, if you're living, you know, far away from a large city, you might not even have access to good medical care and there's a there's some distrust you know from from indigenous people working with medical people just in general from from what's happened in the past mm. and from how they've been treated and so i feel like there's probably even like a push and pull there of like okay we need more access but also are we 
are we willing to trust these people? How do we know we can trust um, these people with our health, with our livelihood, hmm. you know? And and there's a lot of belief that, you know, like that, that we can we can do this ourselves. And so, you know, I think I think there's kind of some push pull there about about I guess what's needed. And I personally think one of the one of the things that would be really helpful is to have more like indigenous people who are doctors. Mm-hmm. And then they're they're able to to treat people in the tribe, but also they would understand where they're coming from and what, you know, what's spiritually they're they're doing what ceremony you know they're understanding their medicine and not just like you know md medicine and they would be able to kind of walk that line Mm -hmm. a little better and create trust and i wonder i don't know how we would do it but i think it would be good to have you know doctors from maybe local cities coming out to the reservation and just meeting people Mm -hmm. not not in a place where they're evaluating right then yes they're just meeting people and learning about life ways and learning their knowledges and and just creating that relationship because Mm -hmm. relationship is really at the center of a lot of tribal belief systems and having that relationship would be invaluable i told you offline that Mm -hmm. i am the director of a homeless drop-in center and we have something worked out with texas a and m they have it they call it maroon Mm -hmm. health gigum Yes. Okay. I'm awesome. 09. Awesome. I, I did not go to a and M. I I love you guys. I love UT. I love all. Please don't. I like everybody. I'm gotcha. Not, I, I'm fine in the past. I root for all you guys when you go play <laughs> Alabama. The schools I went to, they did not have big football teams. But mm. so I kind of, <laughs> I am sidewalk alumni for all these uh, uh, places. And what's great, they have an organization called, they started called Maroon Health, mm-hmm. where they come to Open Gate, Thomas Drop Center that I work at every other Sunday. Mm-hmm. And they provide, they have clinic there. Mm-hmm. So they provide free health care to the people who are there uh, again these are homeless people often if they are housed they're recently housed so they're very low income mm-hmm. they don't have access to certain things i love that idea that how about we work with some health providers and start bringing them maybe once a month mm-hmm. to these reservations to these communities and it's again I've noticed from trying to work in these indigenous spaces, there's a lot of trust that needs to be. Yes. I don't think I've ever heard the word trust so much <laughs> as I've heard in the indigenous population. They, you have to, you have to earn trust. Yes. So we are again taking baby steps, trying to meet with people and talking and building this trust. But I think having some of these medical students come out, and I always say students because students are a bit more malleable. Yes, you absolutely. Can, yes, you can work with them a bit more and kind of teach them certain because they haven't learned. They're not 15 years in in the medical career, and now you're coming with some sage, mm-hmm. and they're like, no, "What are you doing?" Like, mm-hmm. no, no, they have. They're more open to this. Yes. I think that'd be a great way. We work at University of Houston. Whose house? Coop's house. There you go. <laughs> But with that, maybe we can talk to the medical school here. Mm-hmm. Let's take them to these places. Absolutely. I learned a lot in social services that oftentimes you have to go to the people. Mm-hmm. You can't expect the people to come to you. Yeah. How do we get mm-hmm. some of these medical students to see some of these different cultures? Mm-hmm. When working with these medical communities, oftentimes these young people are coming from the best high schools, mm-hmm. the best colleges. Yeah. They are not... They are not used to this environment. Mm -hmm. They're not used to these different people they're going to be intermingling with. Mm -hmm. Very different social media classes, etc. So I'm positive working at or even visiting a reservation Mm -hmm. is something that would spark something in them because they've never experienced that. This is something that they'd probably jump at doing just to understand that their way is not always the best way. Mm Their way is not the only way. Absolutely. Whatever needs to be done, that's a great idea. Hey, I, I'm on board with that. When we talked offline also, you said that the doctor you have, you're lucky to have a doctor like her because she's in tune with you know herbal medicines and is very supportive of that mm-hmm. journey. Do you think a lot of doctors may be that way? Not in my experience. Gotcha. No. And a lot of times you're finding out about them from the word of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of word of mouth, (laughs) you know, and my doctor wasn't always like this either. When I first started going to her, she was, she was not the same person, but she told me, I told her I I was thinking of trying some new things and I was trying to explain it. And she was like, I want to know, I want to know more. Can you Mm -hmm. email me? Here's my email. Can you email me about that? 
or if you find someone who's a practitioner, can you have them email me? I'd love to learn. Awesome. And just the willingness to hear was so refreshing. Whereas I've had other doctors that think I'm hysterical. <laughs> hysterical. Yes. I mean, well, I, I've even had, and at least for me, I only go to female doctors now. Okay. Because I've had male doctors even just be like, oh, you don't, your knees don't really hurt. Like, you're just dramatic. And so, you know, if I can experience that just at like a, mm-hmm. I'd like a woman kind of, you mm-hmm. know, didn't then think of the level of trust. You know, if you see someone that looks like you, that practices like you, mm-hmm. there's just a level of trust there that you don't have. That's going to take me to my next question. And we've kind of hit on these topics off. So all these questions kind of bleed together. If you have noticed that, that trend I have. The word community. Mm-hmm. It, it's synonymous with the word trust also. Yes. How does community impact health when it comes to people of indigenous backgrounds? Yeah. Oh, wow. Community is a, a massive part of indigenous life. You know, whether you live on the reservation or not, being a part of that community, yeah, it's, I would say it's just it's just everything. It's It's identity. It's belonging. It's... You know, and when you feel disconnected, when you feel far away, when you feel alone, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would say it's almost impossible to be healthy. Like mentally, obviously, you're not healthy in that space. Mm-hmm. You know, but there are connections, obviously, with with our mental health to our physical health, and they've done those studies on you know cancer patients who have hope and who like have a good attitude are more likely to beat the cancer than mm-hmm. those who, who don't, which I just was wild when I was reading about that. But I think it's a similar thing, like when we're in community, when we have each other, when we know there's someone else like me with my experiences, with my even ancestry, you know, that I can, I can relate to and I'm, I'm, I can go to them. I'm not crazy, you know, when I'm coming into these spaces. Mm. I'm supported that it, it makes all the difference. And then I see places like, like for in, in Houston, for example, Okay. I lost my words for a minute. Um, in Houston, they have um, a Cherokee group that meets together here. I've, I've only, I've only seen the dates for it twice, but I know that there are people from Oklahoma that travel down to Houston mm. and gather people together so that even indigenous people that can't live near or on the reservation can find that community with each other. You're originally from Oklahoma, correct? My grandfather was originally gotcha. okay. from Oklahoma. Both my grandparents were from Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Okay. Yeah. And you didn't go to University of Oklahoma? No. Oh, I'm boy. a third generation Aggie. So gotcha. Okay. Was, Fair enough. Okay. It's like in my blood, you know. <laughs> I know there's friction there. I'm like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there's just that piece of, of needing to belong, needing to... So you were mentioning the Cherokee group that meets... Uh, yes. I, I'm assuming monthly or I don't know how often. Okay. I've I've seen dates for it pop up two different times because mm-hmm. at least the Cherokee Nation specifically has an area on their web page for mm-hmm. Cherokees at large. It's people okay. that aren't living on the reservation, and it's just to find that community with, with other people. And even here on U of H, there's it's IAA, Indigenous Awareness Association is yes. what I believe it stands for, and they're just trying to help. Indigenous people on campus, you know, find each other. And even mm. if they're not from the same tribe, they can okay. still find community and support. And then they can also find allies here. Like people, there are people in that club that are mm. not indigenous, but they're committed to listen and to understand and to support in any way that they can. That is amazing. You mentioned me- mental health. Mm-hmm. From talking with other populations, I understand that mental health can be still somewhat of a taboo. Mm-hmm. From talking with you know the different tribes and whatnot, that's still something that's not mm-hmm. as approached, or if it is, it's approached very lightly. Mm-hmm. What has really been your experience in dealing with, is that something you can just go in and talk about? It's definitely harder. Um, it's harder to talk about depression, mm-hmm. anxiety, like those kinds of, yes, mental health. I think people are willing to say, you know, things aren't well with me, you know, or that they're struggling, but then actually going into that mental health piece is, has been more taboo. I know in the, in the Cherokee tribe, Abraham Bearpaw has 
walking in balance. But it's hmm. he has a whole program okay. to teach people how to walk in balance. But it's where they can embrace that Cherokee piece of themselves. And mm-hmm. he uses Cherokee culture to help people find ways into mental health as well. Okay. And, and he's got a good support around that program. It's, it's working yeah, well. Yes. Yeah. I got to uh, Zoom with him a nice. couple months ago. and He's doing really great work. What was, did he have a suggestion to get people, I guess, more actively engaged when discussing mental health? Mm. I, I don't want to speak for him. Okay. <laughs> um, but, because I didn't ask him that direct question. Okay. But the feeling I got was that using culture mm-hmm. to teach these things was a great way instead of saying okay we're going to send you to a psychiatrist Mm -hmm. and we're going to give you some prozac they were saying okay let's use what's already here in our culture Mm -hmm. to to be our good medicine like to to heal us and to get us into a right place and he also I believe from what I from what I read because I went and did more reading on it after okay. we got the Zoom call because I was so interested. You're a professor. You do um, a lot of reading. Yes, I have research is my love language. Um, <laughs> I was like research and, and sarcasm. Paying <laughs> my student loans is my love language. So anyone out there listening, <laughs> if they want to chip in on Dr. Kelly's love language, <laughs> I will gladly appreciate that. That's funny. I tell my students like if I seem in a bad mood, just I want you to know that my order is. Boba tea, fifty percent sugar. Gotcha. You know, if, okay. If you ever need to give me a boost, you feel okay. like I'm in a bad mood. Actually, what's funny is since you're mentioning that now, I am actually starting to grow because I have a garden in my backyard. Mm-hmm. I grow a lot of mm-hmm. different things. I'm actually starting to grow tobacco because I think it was actually your suggestion that when you are engaging with these uh, cultures, especially the indigenous populations, gifts. Gifts are important. And I'm like, and you said tobacco. And I was like, huh, I've never grown tobacco before. So I actually just planted like a week ago. It's at the very seeding part Mm -hmm. stage. So I'm actually growing tobacco as a gift for when we go to these indigenous spaces to offer Mm. to them. So gifts are, that was something I never thought of. Mm -hmm. Gifts. And again, hey, if you get a gift of boba tea, that's actually, hey, that's pretty cool. (laughs) Yes. Yes, reciprocity is important in indigenous groups. Okay. You know. Why do you think that is? I mean, it's, it's. It's kind of interwoven into everything. Mm. And it's not always like, you know, I bought you a coffee, you buy me a coffee. You know, it's yeah, yeah. not like, it's not a pay to play thing. Yes. But but there's just like this we're we're doing for each other. You know, we're helping each other, we're supporting each other. And mm. also like there's like a there's also when I'm coming in and I'm asking for information, for knowledges mm. that aren't mine, that I'm 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 showing that they're, you know, that they're valuable knowledges, and that I understand that they are giving to me of their time, mm. and of their understanding, and of their history, and I'm and that I'm not just like throwing it away. I'm not commodifying it. I am valuing it, and so I can I can give them this gift, and and yeah, not not usually money, usually okay. a thing, but. But also, when we have, you know, I, I help teach that class, the indigenous spirituality class, um, with a woman from the Muscogee tribe. Okay. And you teach that on campus, or yes. Okay. Can yes. I sit in one day? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There's a, an asynchronous one this summer, um, and then I'm teaching it online in the fall. Okay. But we have different speakers come in from different tribes because gotcha. the best way people can learn about a tribe is to talk to someone from mm-hmm. that tribe. That's the goal. Or we like let people know, okay, I'm, I'm teaching you this information, but I learned it mm-hmm. from this person. And for those ones, we are able to pay them an honorarium. But when we're coming before like the tribe or a larger group from the tribe, mm-hmm. we want to bring a gift or something to show that reciprocity, to build that relationship. We're not, we're not looking to, yeah, just pay someone for a one-off thing. We want to have a relationship with these people and show respect. None of it makes sense because we gave you a tote bag to come in and talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very pretty tote bag. It has U of H bond there, has the health, our smile. Thanks for listening to our latest episode. If you like the content and want to help us grow, do me a favor like, share, and subscribe to the Health RCMI channel. Also, tell a friend. 
Special thanks to our producer, Allison Medley, senior graphics designer, Natalie Shipla, and as always, our fearless leader, Dr. Esbenario Bossi. I am your host, Dr. Damien Kelly, leaving you with one simple message. Do good things.